Hey YouTube, it's Mouth Lips Reptiles, and today's video is going to be a little something I think is kind of important. Uh, and this is back to our business series, so we're going to take a little bit of a break from doing all of our bracket stuff. Don't worry, if you're a big fan of that, we're going to get back to it. And we're going to talk about our business series a little bit more again. And this video is going to be about clutch diversification. Good idea or not, is it right for you? Uh, we're going to go a little bit more in depth, like we always do on Patreon, so if you're not a member... By God, you should be just for the uh, Discord. Hell with me, join for the community. Actually, join for me and the community. It's like, you, get, you know, double your money, right? It's like the old double my gum. Although I'm not going to give you a set of blonde twins. So let's get back to our today's video, clutch diversification. Now I got a hook. That usually means we're going to throw out a rattlesnake. I'm not going to do that. That's probably not a good snake for most people's clutch diversification, especially coming from a business standpoint. From a business standpoint, rattlesnakes are actually not a really great thing. I don't have them to make money off them. I have them because I really like them. They make me happy. But something we can use to make an income is this guy here who just shed, so don't mind his cage. He's... And what I like to do with them is use the hook just a little bit. Hey, buddy, how are you going to be today, huh? You going to be fine? I saw that. There you go. Just to kind of get him started. So we can kind of work him around. Now, as you guys can see, for all the rumors that we don't ever... You got just a little bit of shed still on you there. Not bad, though. Oh, I know. I'm going to set you up there. This is our male blood python, right? Uh, now, <laughs> notice the cameraman's backing away, and I'm here hands-on for all those people who wondered how that actually worked. Woo! Oh, fucking bastard. So, we just got bit on camera because he tried to flow... And he went down there. Now, when that happens, how bad is a blood python bite? Well, let's try not to get one on my foot. We did set him down nice and gentle. There it is. Not terrible. You can see it all hooked in there. Ah! That's why we do use hooks for him a lot. They do feel a little worse than a ball python bite. I know. That's because I set you on the table. Usually I just keep you in my hand. But you know what? We'll just work you on the floor since that's what you want to be. I can certainly do that. And it'll give me a chance to clean out your shed. <laughs> We're also going to bleed on camera today. So, with these guys, this will make you wonder if maybe clutch diversification is a good idea or not. I'm going to tell you it still is. Here's the thing. I personally believe if you're going to be going to a lot of shows, which we hope to eventually be doing a lot more of, it's good to diversify your collection and have more things on your table. Well, we're never going to sell more blood pythons and ball pythons. Having them may attract people who then in turn decide to buy ball pythons. It's not going to hurt us to have blood pythons laying there at all. Uh, their bite sucks, but truth be told, that's the first time that one's ever got me since it got pretty good size on it, and that was a warning bite, and that was also my fault. I tried to get to balance on the table, move around. It went underneath. I grabbed it to move it out because I didn't want to do that. It laid in and then I kind of put it down on the floor so it would let go of me uh, and not rip its teeth out, which looking, I don't think it did. So that's awesome. So they are a little bit more of a handful, but when you have these or you have green tree pythons or you have something else, there's something visually different. It's going to set your table apart and having this kind of snake is going to actually help you to sell an animal like a ball python uh, instead of just having you know, everything else everybody else has. This gets people to stop and say, hey, what's that snake right there? Uh, it may also make you drip blood on the floor occasionally. Sorry about that. I'll clean it up. I, mean, I promise I ain't got the hip. The COVID maybe, but not the hip. Uh, at least not since last time I got tested. If I do, my wife and I have something to talk about because I didn't have it when I met her, damn it. And I know she didn't either. <laughs> so I know I'm good. <laughs> anyway, guys. Uh, I believe in clutch diversification, or not clutch, collection diversification, just simply to have that different thing shown. For us, it's going to be blood pythons. You are still pissy. It's also going to be green tree pythons, and it's going to be um, carpet pythons. Those are the things we want to breed a little bit of. When I say a little bit, I truly mean a little bit. I'm not wanting to do a whole ton, just enough that uh, our table has some variety. We'll still do 90% ball pythons, 10% other stuff. Now, why wouldn't you want to do this? Well, there are a few reasons. One, as you can just see, things like this. Some of those animals, especially all the ones I mentioned, baby carpets are very nippy, although they don't do anything. Uh, bloods have this reputation. Although this one's been pretty good. Like I say, this is the first time it's really made me, you know, leak a lot. 
And now we get to do a Matt Got Bent video. Woo! Uh, those probably make the views go up. Probably make the th people who usually do this do this too, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but with that, green trees are also very bitey. And I'm not as much of an expert in these as I am in ball pythons. I am much more knowledgeable when it comes to ball pythons than I am when it comes to bloods, right? Uh, I, I just am. Like, it's not something that I've worked with as much. It's not something I've learned about as much. And I've learned enough to keep them. I've learned enough to work with them a little bit. But there are people way more knowledgeable than I out there. So when you diversify, though, you do have to expand your knowledge base into some more animals uh, as opposed to being able just to focus on one thing, right? So there is kind of that aspect of it. So you kind of have to choose and decide what you really want to do. For me, I think the benefits outweigh the negatives. I think it's better to have more options on the table for people to see as opposed to less. Um, I think that's very important. Now, um, so far we haven't been very good at that. We kind of learned as we went that, hey, we always stop at other people's tables when they have something very interesting. A great example is the first time Kurt and I went to Colorado. What did we film? Did we film a lot of people's ball pythons? Hell no, man. We were filming blackheads and things like that. We went to Colorado to hang out with Corey Heft. And what do we film? His big blood python, right? So those kind of things are what get us into different stuff. So, you know, we learned by what we started finding that we would focus on. So ask yourself that same question. Do you stop at those tables that have the different things on them to see what's going on? And if you do, then it might be a good idea for you to diversify your collection. Kurt, anything you want to add? What other snakes do you think would be good to breed besides what you've mentioned? I think boa constrictors are a great way to go, and you can actually layer them in a little bit heavier than you can these other ones, at least for me you can. Um, but I don't keep the boas here. Actually, Kurt takes care of all of our boas, and we are starting to get into that as well. Plenty of morphs there, plenty of things there. So for me, I would say boas. You could also get into corns. I've never been big into corns. I like something that's just a little more size. I'm not looking for huge. Uh, you could get into berms and retics if you want the huge. They take up a lot of space, and honestly, most people can't handle them as a pet. Um, when I say most people, a lot of reptile people can, but think about the people at the show who come in, they've never had a snake before, they're wanting their first snake. This probably ain't the best idea. I mean, they're going to learn a lesson, you know, more often than they are with a ball python. But a berm, even if it doesn't teach them a lesson or a retic, is just too large for most people to take care of. So there is that. Um, I wonder if Kurt can put little smiley faces on me when I swear when I get bit. That's kind of embarrassing. Actually, I, it's not. I hate getting bit. I always feel like I screwed up. So anyway, that would be the ones I would suggest. Anything else, Kurt? Do you like hognose? Hognose are actually really cool. I didn't even think about those. I know there are people that really work with them a lot. Uh, Dave Kroll, I think, is one guy that does a lot of them. I believe Emily from Snake Discovery is into them. I don't know if she breeds them or not, but I know she's really into them. Hognose are cute little snakes. I like them more than corns, little turned up face. Technically rear fang venomous, but not dangerous at all in the slightest. I mean, you'd have to really let one chew on you, and it's not anything to worry about. Actually makes them, to me, kind of a neat fact. Uh, they also will play dead, especially in the wild. You can scare one or roll over it. It'll smell bad. Its tongue will hang out. Their bellies are usually black, so they look like they're this dead, rotting carcass to make things not want to eat them, especially like humans. So they're really kind of a cool snake, uh, not prone to biting, unlike these guys. So uh, certainly, yes, hognose would be another, another good one. All right, anything else you want to add before we have to sign off of here? No. All right, before we go, one thing I do want to do is when you do get tagged, one of the things you need to do is just get back on your horse. So we're going to go ahead and put him back in here while we're on camera. And we're going to put our hand back on him again, if he will let us, once we kind of see what his attitude is. How's your attitude? Huh? Oh, not too good. Yeah, I see you. Come on. Now you can taste my blood. Give me my hook back. Whoop, oh, not gonna do that, are you? <laughs> oh, come on. There you are. Come on, Flailer. Get in there. Come on. So you can see, you gotta get back on your horse. You can't let them uh, trip you out. And if you ever do get bit by one, 
Let's go ahead and look at that damage really quick before we go. It's really not that bad, guys. You're going to leak a lot more. Let me clean that up for you. This is going to burn worse than the damn bite did. Let's see if we can't. You also do always want to disinfect those bites just because, you know, their mouths are nasty. So you can see the damage isn't like there's no splits or anything like that. It's just some punctures. No big deal. I mean, nothing that's going to ever send you to a doctor or be really bad on a, on a blood that size. Nothing to, to really think about. All right, anything else you want to add, Kurt, before we hop off of here? No. All right, guys, we're going to get off. We're going to slide over to Patreon and talk a little bit more about clutch diversification with those guys. We'll see you next week.